I like the way you just skipped up on the stage. You're obviously a lot younger than me. I just sort of oh, I don't it. know. Gladiators are not ready. Clearly. <laughs> Gladiators are rusty. <laughs> Man, because, I mean, do you, do you still work out? you still go to the gym? Are you still trying to keep trim and fit and...? Um, yeah, yeah. I mean, is that picture still up there or has it gone now? There was a big that picture. That picture was ridiculous. So, your arm is, like, <laughs> thicker than my leg. Uh, it's just, just like... Look at that. I want to, I want to apologise for that picture because advertising <laughs> standards, that's, like, 20 <laughs> years old. So if you was expecting a bodybuilder with blonde hair, I apologise up front. I love the hair. <laughs> it, it, it says mid It just screams mid '90s, yeah, doesn't I know, it? I just know, like I know. But in answer to your question, um, yes, I still go to the gym. I don't train with the goals that I had before, you know, to be bigger and stronger than other people. I really go because actually I love food and I eat too much. Yeah. <laughs> and if I don't go to the gym, it's a simple <laughs> equation. If you eat more calories than you're burning, you get fat. So I okay. go to the gym to burn calories. You go to the gym to eat cake. Yeah, yeah no, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Earn, earn yourself a slice of gatto. Good. Um, brilliant. So I, lo I love that picture of, uh, you know, Mr. Saturday Night. There you were. Because I, I remember Gladiators. I, I grew up in Australia, but I came to the UK in 1993. And I will never forget Jet. She was, the, uh. she was the first woman I recognized to be a woman. Yeah. And she made me feel funny. And, uh, <laughs> and, you were, and there was her, and there was Wolf, and there was yeah. Trojan, and Hunter. Yeah. And there yeah. was Ace. Yes. Like, yeah. why, was that, why did you pick Ace? What was, what's... Um, well, firstly, I'd like, uh, just, I was at a Comic Con on oh, Saturday. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And um, uh, just to encourage you, Jet was there, so, it was, so they, they did a, a wow. reunion of all the gladiators, you know, and uh, Jet was there. Was and, she still uh, in spandex? Was she, she, no, no. she wasn't in a spandex, no. but to encourage okay. her, she looks exactly the same <laughs> she, as she did. <laughs> How did she manage in, uh, that? I don't know, I don't know, <laughs> but she was, actually, she was a very good athlete. She was yeah. a gymnast and these sorts of things. Okay. So, um, yeah, you should have come down, you would have loved, you would have been in your element, wouldn't Is you? she like a psychologist or something now? Yeah, she's kind of, yeah, yeah. She, yeah she's, a, she's a psychologist. And with brains, amazing, yeah, yeah. amazing. Oh, what a cat. <laughs> the one that got away, Ace, <laughs> the one that got away. Um, so, yeah, choosing names, it was a funny thing, really, Glenn, because um, uh, the producers, Nigel Lifko and Ken Warwick, said to me once I got Gladiators, you know, you can choose your name but we'll give you some suggestions. Okay. So they gave me a few suggestions. I can't remember what all of them were. <laughs> were, were any of them Warren? <laughs> no. <laughs> no. No. Um, okay. no, definitely not Warren. <laughs> um, uh, and so one of them was Ace. And uh, I, I, was, I was thinking about it and I thought, well, when they announced you, they'll say like, you know, John Fashnu or Rika Johnson would say, next up is Glenn, the contestant, and he'll be facing the mighty warrior. And then I thought, next up is Glenn, and he'll be facing Ace. <laughs> it didn't really sound yeah. right, if you know what I mean. Yeah, yeah. So, so I was very much like, I don't want to be called Ace. You yeah. can call me any, anything else. Uh, but then Nigel Lifko, the producer, said to me, uh, McVitie's are bringing out a biscuit. Right. And he said, and the biscuit is called Ace. Uh -huh. And he said, and along with that comes £20,000 in advertising to start with. Okay. And I said, I love the name Ace. <laughs> I love the name, mate. It's yeah. always spoken to me on a deep level. <laughs> but, but I did actually regret that, by the way. Oh, really? Um, the, the advertising campaign uh, came out, and uh, back in the 90s, can anyone remember, there was just five TV channels. Wow. Can you remember that? You press one button in on the telly and all the rest would pop back out. <laughs> so, so it was then, so, and the one channel that had the money was London Weekend Television that produced yes. um, Gladiators. Uh, and so... Um, I, I, took, I took this ace job and I thought it's going to be great. And then when the advert came out, it came on in between the show. Uh, and I didn't know what it was going to be. So it was a little ace chocolate biscuit come walking out as a rapper. And I was like, what, is that supposed to be me then? <laughs> and this chocolate biscuit went up to the top of a building. It put a bungee cord around its feet and it jumped off and it smashed on the floor. <laughs> and I thought, where are they going with this? How am I like this chocolate biscuit? And then the voiceover said, ace the incredibly thick chocolate biscuit. <laughs> <laughs> and as, as, honestly, you look on YouTube, I'd never live that down, so... so was that I, your voice doing that? No, it, no, it no, wasn't no, my no, voice, it wasn't my voice. Um, but I, I never lived that down for years, oh, years later. Mm. It looked like tremendous fun, though, like on a Saturday night, but of course you wouldn't have filmed it on a Saturday night. It, it looked glitzy and glamorous and just squeaky clean yeah. and fun, yeah. but the reality behind the gloss, what was it like? Yeah, so, so although it looked like a live show, mm. we filmed the whole series in one month. 
Right. So we were filming two shows a day, and you know, although it canned down to sort of half hour, an hour, um, it took all day to film it. So mm. we'd pick up injuries mm. quite quickly, you know, because there was a lot of pressure on us when we were fighting. It was a bit like um, uh, footballers, if they're not scoring goals, you know, they, they lose their jobs. And it was the same in gladiators. If we didn't get 70% wins as a gladiator against the contestant, we found that our contracts weren't renewed. You were told that? Yeah. Um, well, we saw that in yeah. action because, yeah, yeah. you know, so many gladiators came and went. Right. And so we had this dream job that you never wanted to lose. So there's a lot of pressure, you know, and as a, as a result, we sustained a lot of injuries. Mm -hmm. um, by the end of the series, you know, by the end of the month, it, does, it sounds easy, doesn't it? You work one month a year and you earn great money. But the reality is that was a real tough month because we were literally smashed to pieces by the end of it. And we had some very bad injuries, really? broken backs and necks and no fatalities, but we had some very bad injuries, yeah. Seriously. Yeah. And you looked like you were great mates on screen. Is that true back in the dressing room as well? Um, yes, but, but there was rivalry mm -hmm. because, you know, we, we, if, if you lost the game, the pressure was on you then because you go back up and you, and you don't want fear to take your strength. But it does, because you think, if I lose again, I might get sacked. Wow. Um, so as much as we sort of built each other up, there was this, this um, uh, 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 we, we were compared, competitive. And, I, and, I, and I, I'll admit it, we're not filming this or anything, are we? I'll admit <laughs> it, we, if, if another gladiator lost the game, I was secretly mm. a bit relieved, because I thought, well, well, that takes the pressure off me. It could be him that gets a chop next sure. instead of me. So, you know, it wasn't as comfortable as... Uh, yeah. as you would think backstage. It wasn't all friends having a laugh. Yeah. And were you sort of catapulted overnight into the public eye? Did it, did it suddenly become completely different? Everyone sees Warren Furman, but they don't see Warren Furman. They see Ace out, yeah. out and about. Yeah. What was yeah. that like? Yeah. Uh, well, I, well, I come from uh, a council estate. My dad was a roof tiler, very working class. Um, uh, four, four brothers uh, initially. Uh, one died. Had quite a tough uh, upbringing. And my dad said to me, he said, uh, son, Skills pay the bills, mm -hmm. you know, and he used to say, what is it, dirty hands, clean money, and if you want a happy life, you'll work hard all your life. But watching my dad, that's not what I saw unfold. Mm -hmm. I saw my dad and mum sort of living for the weekend, my dad mm -hmm. working harder than anybody else that I knew. Um, so growing up, um, I thought, actually, I don't want, I don't believe that hard work's going to make you happy. Mm -hmm. I want to be rich and famous. It was a celebrity culture mm -hmm. uh, then in the 90s, like it is, like it is now. Right. So I thought, well, Dad, you know, you're telling me all this stuff. It sounds like great advice, and I know you're worried for me, but actually I want to be rich and famous. So uh, in answer to your question, when, when that happened, mm. um, uh, it was a, a massive relief because that's what I'd aimed for, and there was yeah. a lot of times where I'd sacrificed a lot and, you know, and trained, and it didn't look like it was going to happen. And I yeah. thought, you know, maybe I've deluded myself. Yeah. It caused a lot of t uh, tension, actually, Glenn, between me and my dad because obviously he didn't think that was possible. He used to say... You say, Warren, they've got their lives, you've got yours. You're not going to be rich and famous, you're deluding yourself. Right. You're not going to be on the TV and be a movie star. And back then it was mm -hmm. Arnold Schwarzenegger, you know, he's the highest paid movie star. He, uh, was, quite, he was quite an influence on you. He was quite an icon for you, Schwarzenegger. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. And, you know, if you... It stands to reason if you get one life, and when, as I was growing up, the average age for a man was 70 years old. I thought you get one life. Uh, like I say, my little brother died, so my mum and dad said, there's no God, don't, don't delude yourself, there's a God. If there was, your brother wouldn't have died. Mm -hmm. um, and I thought, and do I really want to just work all week like a dog, like I'm watching my dad do, and then just struggle from hand to mouth, waiting for a paycheck? Um, so, so I just looked out and I thought, no, I want to be rich, I want to be famous, Arnold Schwarzenegger's doing it, mm -hmm. and all I can see him doing is going to a gym, lifting weights, um, and he's having this fabulous life as, as a superstar. So mm -hmm. that's exactly what I put my heart and all my effort into doing. And you achieved it to a degree. I mean, you, you became famous. You were, you were on this Saturday program that was sort of uh, defining for a generation, and, and you, were, you were part of that whole merry-go-round. Mm. What, what were the fun bits about that? Oh, well, all of it was fun. Have you ever been to a wacky warehouse here? <coughs> so it was like a wacky warehouse for adults. So the, 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 <laughs> like a soft play, in, yeah, indoor absolutely, soft play. Absolutely. Yeah, so yeah, the, yeah, the, like, yeah. the games we were playing were phenomenal. You know, yeah. there was, Hang Tough was another one that I used to love. Just uh, so much fun there, you know, so much fun to be had. <laughs> but if you can imagine, literally, when I got to sort of uh, 18, my dad said to me, well, you don't want to come and work and work on the roof, so I'm kicking you out. He said, you know, you've got a lot older, um, you're eating everything out of the cupboards, right. all your brothers are working, and you expect me to sustain you. So um, he kicked me out. Also, he was a little bit worried, in all honesty, Glenn, because at that point, uh, all my brothers were sort of putting posters on the wall in their teenage years of 
Kylie Minogue and these things, and my posters were of like <laughs> men in pants yeah. with oil sliced alone. And, <laughs> and I think my dad was a bit like, I'm not sure where this boy's going with all this. So, <laughs> so um, he was confused, and, and yeah. I think he thought I was. And so I actually I, I, I moved into the YWCA, the Young Women's Christian Association in Harlem. Yeah, very confused. Yeah, yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you weren't a Christian. Yeah. 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 Well, it's worst places for a teenage lad to be, actually. Yeah, sure. But uh, it was um, essentially I was homeless because that was a hostel. But in answer to your question, overnight I went from literally being homeless in a hostel um, to being on the biggest TV show because uh, you, cause you like, sent in a photograph or like, what's that, like that somebody saw you in a gym and went... No, no, so I'd been bodybuilding yeah. um, and actually I wrote into the show. So back then it wasn't emails and texts and these things. I had to write a letter. Can anyone remember, remember a letter? Remember those? Yeah. Back in the 1900s? <laughs> yeah. 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 yeah, with a pen, yeah, and I dipped it in the quill, the quill in the <laughs> end. So, uh, Someone on horseback <laughs> took it to London. <laughs> Um, so, yeah, I wrote a letter and then they invited me to a tryout at Blackfriars in London mm. where there were 60 other bodybuilders and we, we, we essentially just um, started to fight each other for the <laughs> afternoon. Um, and and I, I noticed actually that although we were, there was lots of people fighting, there was a lot, lots of people a lot bigger than me as well and I thought, you know, I really want this job. What, are, what, what, what do I have that they don't have? And I noticed that as they were fighting, they were very, very aggressive because mm. they really wanted this job. So they were really, you know, trying to kill each other. Um, and so I think I caught a gap in the market there on that day because mm -hmm. I just thought, if I can go out there and fight but do it with a smile on my face... Right. They... And that sense of parting. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. And that's yeah. essentially what I did. I went out yeah. and I tried to show controlled aggression. Yes. It's very difficult when someone's hitting on your head to keep a <laughs> smile, you know. It was, it was a little bit awkward, um, but I think that's what got me the gig, Yeah, yeah. honesty. So it does, it does sound like a lot, a lot of fun. And what, what were the harder parts about this... Like, you know, I mean, partly you've got to keep on winning or you lose your job. You, you, yeah. You're on top now and everyone is literally trying to topple you. What, what are some of the other hard things about being a gladiator? Um, I think essentially the first thing that I noticed was that all my, you know, three very close brothers and they sort of moved away from me. All my friends started to move away from me. But suddenly I had lots of new friends, right. tons of new friends. Right. And these new friends would do anything for me. Right. And, you know, my, my, my real friends and my brothers were a bit like, you've got so many people clinging on it's not nice being around you anymore. And because, you know, I was in this elevated position, I was just like, well, they must be jealous. Mm -hmm. I couldn't see what was happening. But actually, so, so that was the first thing of celebrity culture that was a bit of a shock to me. Actually, instead of, you know, I wanted to be famous and accepted and big and strong, these things, but actually I started to see that actually it's separating me mm -hmm. from people, so that came as a shock. Mm -hmm. um, and also I thought that once I got all this money and this fame, um, that once I got all the material stuff I wanted, I'd be happy. And that came as a shock to me when I wasn't. Right. I found that I, I didn't know this, but I, that you don't own property. Property actually owns you. I thought if I mm. buy my own house, then I'll be happy. And then you buy your own house, and then you spend all this time and money on it and doing this, and you've got to get, get another one. So I just started to see that I felt a bit like a dog chasing its own tail at, at, yeah. at times. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And like I say, the celebrity culture in itself, it started to make my heart hard. You know, I saw a lot going on that I couldn't really talk about. You know, and, and we, look at, we listen to Donald Trump when he talks about fake media and you know, these Weinstein scandals about so much power in organisations. And when I was on television, it was no different. Uh, right. You know, so the big, the big shows of Saturday night, when I was on TV, were you like um, Michael Barrymore's, mm -hmm. um, uh, Ralph Harris, Jimmy mm -hmm. Savile, you know. Yeah. Uh, there's lots of people yeah. that I knew on a personal level um, that I knew they weren't what they were saying they were in the papers. And so, interestingly, people would come to me and say, you know, what's this fella like? What's that fella like? And I'll be like, um, well, they're not what they say they are in the papers, right. but I couldn't say any more than that. Yeah. What um, would you say about yourself? Like, who, who were you? Who, but behind the mask, behind, behind Ace, oh, who was Warren oh, Furman? Well, everyone point? was terrible, but I was perfect, Glenn. Right, course, yeah. okay, yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, yeah. So, uh, no, show business started to corrupt me because <clears throat> yeah. I saw that with the money came power. Right. And I saw that I could manipulate. I saw that I could pretty much have... It's funny in celebrity, you get everything for nothing. So I used to just manipulate everything for myself. Uh, and like I say, I saw very questionable behaviour, questionable behavior, you know, because with that, I could literally have every, anything that I want. Mm -hmm. And so even in relationships, you know, I just started to take what I wanted from them and really abusing people, really. I wasn't becoming a good person. And I knew that um, things were getting dark and I was getting cynical mm -hmm. and hard-hearted by it all. Mm -hmm. um, and it's, it's strange. It's like the more ruthless you get, the more rewarded you are. You know, I was, I was right. dating Katie Price for a couple of years and we used to just get up in the morning and just make up a pack of lies and sell it to a newspaper. Yeah. So I'd see my dad, you, you think of that contrast, I'd see my dad working hard 
all week. And he couldn't make as much in that week as I could make just ringing up the sun. Right. Star, the news of the world, just making up a pack of lies. Yeah. So, you know, what does that do to a man's soul? Yeah, yeah, when yeah. you're saying, actually, I'll get rewarded in life, and I'm the one that's celebrated. Yeah. And in the, it's a strange thing, because I was always looking down on people, because I was judging them, because I thought, well, I must be blessed. I'm famous. Mm -hmm. So I never looked up. And that's a strange thing. I started right. to believe that, you know, that I'd followed Schwarzenegger. He was my idol. And now people were idolizing me. Yeah. So you, you climbed to the top and you realized it wasn't what you wanted it to be. And that didn't make you look up at that point. It, no. made, you, it made you what? Just go after the next goal? And no, the next no, goal. empty really. Like I say, yeah. hard hearted, empty, and, and separated. You know, I thought mm. that, that, that once I was famous and I had all these things, and that, it's funny when I was looking really, I think looking back, I think I was looking for communion and people. And you know, and I, that's where I'm most happiest when I'm around people in relationships. Yeah. And yet this money and this fame was separating me. Yeah. So it was a bit of a conundrum. I couldn't work out why that was happening. And yeah. I was also aware that nobody really wanted to know me for me anymore. They wanted to know Ace from Gladiators. Right. So I try and make <laughs> friends, and then sure enough, you know three or four months into the relationship, they'd say, can you come around my kid's party and open it up? And I'd get a bit offended, because I'd be like, oh, I thought I was your friend. I didn't know you wanted Ace right. on Gladiators. So right. it's funny, isn't it? You hear about people winning the lottery and getting great wealth and these things bestowed upon them, and, and then they struggle with it because they can't trust any, anyone anymore. So I thought that was quite divisive. And it's right. funny because my uh, wife, she works uh, at Virgin Atlantic and she works in first class. And, um, and I, I sort of make that analogy sometimes. You know, you sit on that plane of that jumbo, and really, you're so privileged to be going up 30,000 feet, having a meal, and going anywhere in the world, when you think about it, where we are in history. And yet, we'll sit up in that, in that yeah. <laughs> looking up, thinking, I want to get up past that curtain. Right. Because I, I, that's where you're rich. That's, that's obviously where you're going to make it. But what I've found is that when you're up there, yeah. and it's the same in first class, as far as I'm concerned. Yeah, yeah. You pay all these thousands for a seat. And there's only like six of you up there and you're looking at the floor and the party's at the back. <laughs> yeah. Do you yeah. know what I mean? I think yeah, it's, a yeah. bit, it's like money can separate you like that. Yeah, totally. I mean, you must have woken up at times, though, thinking, look, there must be millions of men who would like to be me dating Katie Price. Mm. Or Jordan. Was she Katie Price or was she Jordan then? Or Jordan was, back then. She yeah. was Jordan back yeah. then. But you got to know Katie Price a little bit? You, yeah. Like, like, so... on. on Everybody's, how do you get to feel empty when everybody's looking to you and saying you're living the dream? Like, that's interesting. I think you've got to look at the uh, pleasure, the paradox of pleasure. Right. The more you get, the less it satisfies. Mm. And so I think, you know, in a normal situation where people can actually enjoy sitting in the garden and having a meal or, or just being around their family, I couldn't enjoy that anymore. Mm. Life didn't shine anymore. You know, if I'm in front of millions of people and I'm on the TV and I've got these celebrity girlfriends and a new Bentley Continental and I'm like, yeah, yeah, but then all of a sudden this is not worth anything anymore to you. You can't enjoy yourself. And I started to see that life didn't shine for me unless I was high. So I started looking for them highs. Mm. And when you're a celebrity, you get invited to every celebrity function that there is because you become a commercially important person, a mm. CIP. So you get invited to is all... Is that a thing? A yeah, so, yeah, so if you, if you get on an aeroplane, right. you know, the staff are told it, it'll be a little CIP next to your name. It means you're commercially important. You're a commercially important person. Wow. And what that means is that if they put you in first class, everyone's going to want to be in first class. So you'll get in for free because you're most commercially important. Goodness. Um, I uh, think I'm a CWP, a commercially worthless person. <laughs> <laughs> well, I knew what a VIP was, but I had no, yeah, I had no yeah. idea at the time that you could be... Yeah. Uh, you know, a, a, a CIP. Yeah, yeah. So, you're getting to feel this kind of emptiness at the same time as adulation and all that sort of stuff. So, it, it must have come as a, a, a big shock, did it, when the money ran out for the show or, you know, the producers decided to call time on Gladiators? How was, how was the news broken to you? Uh, well, when I started the show, you know, TV, like anything else, has a shelf life. Everything's mm. subject to the law of impermanence. And so they'd given Gladiators a lifespan of three years. And it actually ran for 10 years because it was such a popular show, so they kept, you know, doing different international shows and stuff. Um, but I joined it in sort of its six year or seven years, so I knew I was already sort of on a bit of a gravy train. Mm. So I knew that I just had to, you know, if I, if I could... I'd come from, like I say, a, quite a prim primitive background, if you like, and we, we had no financial acumen. None of us were homeowners and stuff, so I thought, well, if I could use some of this money to maybe secure a home and better myself, um, you know, that, that'll be enough. Mm. Um, so that's really what, what I tried to do. Okay. So you knew it was coming, and you were, you were sort of prepared. And yes. Yeah. yeah. And so what does, what does an ex-gladiator do? 
<laughs> Have you seen Krusty the Clown in Simpsons? Yeah, yeah. You know, he just sort of turns up to kids' parties. <laughs> hey, hey, hey! <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, yeah no, it, was, it was quite, a, it was quite a, um, a shock, really, because, first of all, um, again, being show business, we were the last to find out. I just got the paper in the morning, and I used to get that with Kate. We'd get the papers, and she'd look through them, and if she weren't in them, she'd get a bit depressed. Because <laughs> her identity was like mine, you know, if you're, if you're in the public eye, this gives you value, you know. And so we'd look through the papers, and the first thing I saw is uh, Gladiators, and it was a thumbs down, and it said, you are daddy. Oh. And then another one I said, you know, another one bites the dust, and it was a picture of me, and I thought, man, that's grim. <laughs> wow. Um, so we found out in the worst, uh, the worst type of way. Um, and then, of course, all of these things started to fall away from me. So literally overnight, my telephone stopped ringing. Mm. And that shocked me, because I thought I had loads of friends. I thought I was so popular. Um, and then all of a sudden, it was like, no friends. And all the old friends that I had were just, they, you know, they'd moved on in their lives. They were starting businesses, they had families. And I was just like this sort of, this, this guy who had no, no skills to pay the bills that my mm -hmm. dad had warned me about. You mm -hmm. know, I could, I could hit someone on the head with a stick, but that was about it. <laughs> you know, and when you go, when you go to the job centre and you say to them, um, uh, I'd like a job, and they say, what are your skills? And you say, <laughs> well, uh, I can hit someone on the head with a stick, and they write that down. And then they say, and how much would you like to get paid an hour? And I say, well, on the show, I was paid £2,000 an hour. They're like, uh, Mr. Firm, there's not many jobs that will pay you two grand an hour to hit someone on the head with a stick. So it was yeah. quite, a, it was quite a, an empty place to be. So, so um, at that point, uh, I decided I needed to train and get a job, mm -hmm. you know, and get a proper job. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and I became a site manager. Yeah, great. A construction site manager. And how soon before you got married? Um, it was a while, actually. Again, mm. uh, Glenn, I didn't believe. It, again, bear in mind that now I'm a, my, I'm a dark soul. I might look healthy mm. on the outside, but inside I was spiritually bankrupt. I'd, seen, I'd had such a glimpse of life and show business and what Hollywood promises. But actually, it made me quite a dark soul. Mm. So, so although I met my, my now wife after the, the TV show, I still didn't trust. I had no trust. Mm -hmm. And so I thought, well, if I look in the secular world at what marriage is, it says 50% of marriages fail. Mm -hmm. And if I said to you, do you want to come parachuting, but 50% of the chutes don't open, mm. we don't go parachuting, do we? No. And so that's how I saw, um, that's how I saw marriage. So I didn't marry my, my wife, although we had kids and stuff, I didn't marry her for ages because I was just too cynical. I thought, if I marry her, I know this sounds terrible, but I just thought, if I marry her, then she's going to have the power. And, and, and actually, if I step out of line, or if I slip, she's just going to take all my money that I've earned mm -hmm. and disappear. Because mm -hmm. you see that happen loads, don't you, mm -hmm. in society? Mm -hmm. You know, someone, they go on Facebook, find an ex-partner, split the house enough, someone takes a dog, someone takes the kids, and everything falls apart. So yeah. Yeah. I weren't buying into that. Yeah, yeah. I've gone Rogan on you, and I? What did you ask me? <laughs> What did you ask me? You met your wife. You yeah. met the woman that you yes, became so, your wife yes. soon after the Yeah, the, so the we fell in love. And, I yeah, moved, yeah. yeah, I was in pantomime. I moved to York. Okay. I went to pantomime in York. Uh, yeah. And I've got to get this the right way around. I fell in love with my wife. Then I fell in love with York. And that's where I moved. Okay, fantastic. But still, this emptiness and then this desire to, to find out if there's more. Uh, where, did, where did that journey take you? Well, I was quite blessed in that, you know, the world, the world was telling me, you know, life is about you, even at school. It's about what are you going to be. It's all about you, what you're going to get. It's about your career. It's about having a good life. Um, and so I'd really had all that very early on. You know, I'd, I was quite fortunate in that I was blessed in all this material stuff of pursuing happiness, getting everything that I wanted, achieving all the things that I wanted. But I noticed that there was that perpetual set the goal achieve it, success, euphoria, and then complete, uh, complete emptiness with it, complete emptiness. So um, I knew that if I paid my own house off, which I'd done, or if I went on the best holidays or the best, had the best partners or the best cars, actually, it's only temporary happiness. There's no joy and there's no peace from it. And actually, I was living in fear all the time, trying to fit, because as I moved up in society as well, mm. Like, they get richer, and they get richer, and they get richer. So yeah. I was constantly chasing my tail. So once I knew that actually this is a bit of a hoax, it's a trap. That's why they call it in fame, trappings. It will <laughs> trap you. I was like, okay, so what is, I know it might sound a bit deep, but for what is the purpose of life? You know, what are we actually born for? Bear in mind, I've been diverted by, from God by my parents. So right. I was like, well, there's got to be another reason. I knew that spiritually... I was empty, mm. and I didn't know why, so I went on a real spiritual search. And again, in a celebrity culture, if somebody had mentioned Jesus to me or God to me, I just saw Jesus and God as a complete weakness. You know, Jesus floats around in the night crying at people at sad things. I thought, I want nothing to do with that. 
I've met Christians before and they just seemed like, I don't know, just a bit spacey and I don't know, there was something that, and churches as well, no disrespect, I come into church and sit up, stand up, sit down, stand up, sit down. I didn't understand what was going on. I have attention deficit disorder, so I didn't understand. Um, And so um, I went on this spiritual search and I literally looked everywhere. I looked at every religion, every teaching, every spiritual teaching. I found lots of religions. I found they were all morally commendable. Mm -hmm. I thought they had some good rules. If you obey these rules, you might have a good life. They were good, they were conducive for family. I thought that's really good. Um, I looked at um, uh, 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 Buddhism, Hinduism, Taoism, you name it. I was looking at, I looked at, I read all the atheist books, you know, Mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. um, I started to realize that all of these things offer you something if you do something, if you earn it, you know, if you, if you do this, you'll get that. If you, you know, it's a bit like, like I say, you buy a Hawkins or a Dawkins, Squawkins book, and they say, (laughs) we'll we'll do this for you. We'll do this for you. You give us the 15 quid for the book and we're going to fill you spiritually. And you read this book and you get to the end and think, hang on. Yeah. I'm just more cynical than I've ever been. Right. You've not done anything but put more money in your bank. Right. Right. And you've gone out, it's like a Ponzi scheme. You're at the top of the triangle and I'm yeah. somewhere down the bottom. All yeah. I've done is financed you. Yeah. And now you're telling me to go on one of your conferences and buy another one of your books. Yeah. And I found this with a lot of atheists. You know, they'll stand and go, it's God is a delusion, follow me. And I'm like, <laughs> I'm like man, that's arrogant. Um, so like I say, and I looked at lot, lots of these. I loved a lot of it. You know, I love um, Anthony Robbins. I thought he was great. He stands right. here with a big glove on. You can do it, self-help. You can do it yourself. But the reality is, you're doing it for him. As you pay, <laughs> as you pay for his yeah. new book. And, for it, and he's up here and he's winning and he's winning. So unless you get involved in that Ponzi scheme, actually none of these things offer the freedom that they wow. promise. Wow. And I found that again with a lot of um, your esoteric teachings and stuff. You know, they say... Yeah, Buddhism, I mean, I found that really quite um, interesting because you open the pages and it, and, it, and it sort of says life's about others, but then you've got to sit on a mountain on your own meditating and then it says you're not a human... What is it? You're not a human doing, doing. you're a human, human being, being, so just mm-hmm. be. Mm-hmm. So I'm like, hmm. Mm-hmm. I'm thinking, this is not very practical. Well, you know, where do I go <laughs> from here? And it says you're going to transcend. But like I say, all these empty, empty promises... Um, that all pretty much led nowhere. They just sort of self-defeating, if you like. Um, But what I did notice in a lot of the teachings, the ones that made sense, there was the teaching of Jesus Christ. Right. And and it'd be like Jesus said, Jesus said. I'm thinking, I've noticed a common affair, uh, you know, and Mm -hmm. you think there's analysis paralysis. Sometimes you can be so overloaded Mm -hmm. with information that, you know, instead you think, I can't make a decision. And people used to say, oh, well, you know, you can just choose. A religion, you just choose. It's like choosing a flavor of ice cream. Right. And I'm like, no, it's not. One's the truth and one's a lie. Right. <laughs> I don't want to live a lie. If right. there's truth, I need to know the truth. And there's going to be one truth. Right. Um, so, like I say, every time I read about Jesus Christ, uh, I could see there was something in that. And actually, I don't mind admitting that I still have my, you know, I believe everyone's got their faith in something. In something. Some people's politics, some people academics, some people themselves, mm. some people the media, some people mm. banking. Um, and my faith was definitely still in money. You know, I thought if I have maybe mega wealth, that will make me happy. If I have a private jet and if I have these things. And uh, interestingly enough, uh, Glenn, at this point, I was, I was praying. In fact, when I was on television, I was praying. Hmm. I'd say, God, I want this man to fall off of this jewel so I win. <laughs> uh, and sometimes I got knocked off and I'm like, where was you in that, God? But again, <laughs> nobody had explained to me that actually God's not going to answer your prayers yeah. because you're separated from him. You have to come into his unconditional love. You have to invite him into a relationship with you. Nobody explained this to me. The sure. simple gospel, nobody. Um, and it was actually an alpha course that I was invited on by accident. I was invited to, um, again, the spirit drawing, I'm sure of it. Mm-hmm. Um, I was invited uh, to a guy called Julian Richards uh, Fellowship Group. Um, and this is a guy that owns Richard Sounds, the, the hi-fi chain. You know, he's one of the most successful businessmen um, in this country. Um, and he's very ethical and these things. And um, I thought, wow, I'd heard that, he, you know, Prince Charles pays him hundreds of thousands for business advice and these things. And I thought, wow, as a social climber, this would be a great place for me to go and network. Mm-hmm. I should go around there. And I went to his... Uh, fellowship, and um, I was looking for Julian, I was looking around, I couldn't find him, some guy was pestering me, do you want a fork, do you want this, do you want that, and I was like, where's this Julian, and, and someone said to me, that's him that just served you, Yeah. Wow. and I, that was a bit strange for me, Glenn, because mm. I, m- most people I met that were rich or famous, they derived their identity from who they were, you know, their position, their watch, their car, and here's a guy that weren't, right. and I always assumed Christians were poor people, mm-hmm. they had to give everything away, so I was like, uh, I was like, so, so this is that rich guy and these sorts of things. Anyway, I got him on his own 
And I said to him, I want some advice. And he tried to give me some practical advice. And I said, no, this is a, a spiritual thing. Wow. How come you've got all this wealth and you seem to have peace and joy? And he said to me, I'm going to prescribe you two things. Mm -hmm. If I prescribe them, will you go on them? And I said, what are they, Julian? And he <laughs> said, uh, number one, go on an alpha course. And I didn't know what an alpha course was. Just to explain what an alpha course is, if people don't know. Um, do you know what a Christianity Explored course is? Yeah, or okay, so, or... so it's like that, I think, <laughs> um, but without the word Christianity in it. And to be honest, if he had said Christianity, I would have cut him off there hmm. because I already had a preconceived idea uh, of what Christianity was. Hmm. So when he said, But it is, of course, introducing the basics of the Christian faith or, yeah, well, it's, well, it's thinking a, more deeply about life. Yeah, well, an alpha course for me, it was somewhere where, uh, where I went and I could actually ask questions, the big questions that were my objections to what Christianity was telling me. Mm -hmm. And so that, you know, I hadn't been offered that before. And like I say, if he had said it was something religious, I wouldn't have gone. But so when he initially said, go on an alpha course, I was like, well, that sounds like good advice. Another course, hope it's not a Ponzi scheme. <laughs> and then he said, um, and then get baptized and come back to me. When he said, get baptized, I thought, oh no, mm. he's a Bible basher. Mm. But then I thought, why would he be trying to recruit me? He's got all this money. But mm. bear in mind again, with that cynical heart, you know, people, I used to see a church as hatch, match, dispatch. Mm -hmm. It's there, it says it's there for your safety, it's there for your health, it's there to look after you. But mm -hmm. I saw it like a speed camera. Mm -hmm. It's mm -hmm. there, it says it's looking after you, but it's there to generate revenue. That's how, <laughs> that's how cynical I was. You know, I, just, yes. I didn't trust at all, Glenn. Yes. Um, but of course, I went on the Alpha course. I was confronted with the person of Jesus Christ. Right. I had no idea that he was real. I had no idea that it was the most important event in human history. I had no idea that we're living in the golden age of God where he's pouring out his spirit on anybody who believes in Jesus Christ. I had no idea that I was building an empire and all empires crumble, always have, always will. Uh, and, and only God's kingdom remains. And I had no idea that actually I could be part of that. It all sounded so fantastically ridiculous mm -hmm. that I just couldn't wrap my head around it. So mm -hmm. for that six weeks in the Alpha course, um, it just really blew me away that I was able to ask these questions yeah. and more importantly, examine the evidence. Yeah, you really investigated, didn't you? Absolutely. And I, and I know I was a pain on that course because, <laughs> you know, they tried to go to the next page and I'd be like, hang on, <laughs> what Dead Sea Scrolls? And I'd be on a train to London and I'd be checking them out. I had no idea that the Codex Sinaiticus is in the British Library and it's the first Bible and the words that are in that are the same one. You actually went down to London and checked that out? Yeah, I went all over the place, checking all this stuff out. You went, you went to Manchester to check like a fragment of John's Gospel Absolutely. or something? Absolutely, yeah, well, it's a yeah. fragment of John's Gospel in the sacred text in the, in the British Library as well. Yeah. So, so all over the place. So I didn't realise as well that, you know, I started to look at the Bible and started to see that it was historically consistent and that it was a practical book. Yeah. And, and again, nobody had explained, actually, that none of this really will make sense to you until you're saved, because it will confound you, because you're not saved. It won't make a lot of sense mm -hmm. until you can come to the end of yourself, right. invite Jesus Christ into your life, and you'll be filled by his spirit, and things will start making sense, because <laughs> you will, you'll be in a relationship with God. But like I say, that Alpha course uh, was, you know, a massive turning point. It was literally the, the difference between uh, life and death, everything changed. Because you said, you, you, you've used the word saved a couple of times. What does, what does that even mean, saved? How would you, how would okay, you explain so, that? So, you know, we live in a world where, where, where I think death predominantly is hidden. Mm. You know, you're lucky if you get 70, 80 years, uh, and everyone's resisting death, especially in the line of business I was in as a personal trainer and a gladiator. It's like, just stay young, do what you can, inject your face, <laughs> do anything you can, but don't look at death. Let's hide the sick children. Let's put the old people in homes, but let's not look at death. Nobody wants to know it. And then when it comes, it's like a silent assassin, you know, that snatches someone in your family or, or, or you, and it's like, this makes no sense. Mm. You know, and I saw that extreme embalming program where someone dies because they were addicted to alcohol and cigarettes, and then they... You know, they were stuffing the person, putting a cigarette in their mouth, and, and when they drink in their hand, and they're saying, let's celebrate their life, and they're going the same way. You know, so I right. just saw that, that, that life was completely mad. But then when I started to read um, that, that actually this wasn't God's plan, and actually um, you're really on, you're created by a creator, and, he, and it's unconditional love, and actually you choose him, and he's going to give you 78 years. How many have years to choose him? And that's the way it works. And you can choose not to. And people say, oh, you know, I'll be in hell with my mates. It's all where my mates are. And I'm like, um, no, anything, that, well, what I'm reading is anything that's good is of God. It, uh, is of God. Mm -hmm. and, and when you've decided, actually, you don't want to know God, and you're going to take, you're going to hedge your bets and just say, no, nah, actually, I don't want to know that because I'm following things in this world. Mm -hmm. Hell is eternal separation from God. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, and that's a big risk to take, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> a yeah. massive risk to take. So um, it really made sense you know, when you're looking, going back to looking at the purpose of life, 
really made sense to me. Actually, we weren't meant to die, and actually, we're not going to die. And it's really interesting that after I said that prayer where I invited God into my life, um, from being someone who was always had to be in control and quite a manipulator, if you like, mm. um, I lost a lot of fears almost straight away. Mm. Mm. And, so, and so initially, like I say, I was cynical, like, so I'm going to be filled by this supernatural power that's of God, like what, like Bruce Almighty, I'm going to, yeah, uh, and, then, and then I'm going to live forever, and then I'm going to know God. It all sounded so, so outrageous to me. It, I found mm-hmm. it difficult to even conceive of it. And like I say, and, and all this was going to happen by just a simple invite. God is such a gentleman that he lets you choose, and that's how love has to be. You have to yeah. invite that in. And, and like I say, I said that prayer, <laughs> and um, things started to happen pretty much um, straight away, not, not on the night. Um, but for example, I'll just give you an example. My wife's an air hostess, as I said, and I had a real fear of flying, like massively. I used to just, as soon as I get on that plane, I'd have to drink half a bottle of gin, you know, mm-hmm. just so I could get through the flight. Um, uh, and, and I remember getting on a plane after saying that prayer, and I had absolutely no fear mm-hmm. in me mm-hmm. whatsoever, none at all. And I thought, oh, this is strange, where's that gone? I, yeah. I used to have to try and get blind drunk as I got on it, because I'd be yeah. thinking, oh, I could die, and this would be the worst thing that's happened to me. And God started to put your family back together as, as well, because your wife was sort of on this journey as well, in terms of discovering Jesus, is that right? Yeah, interestingly enough, you know, it was, it was actually, if I, I find it difficult to get the date sometimes, but we got married in a church just before I was saved. So here's an interesting thing. I suddenly went to my now wife after 15 years and said, we got to get married, and she was like, well... What's the point now? You've waited all this time. I'm over 40, mm-hmm. whatever. And she says, what for? I said, no, because I didn't understand that God's design for human happiness is family. Mm. And actually marriage is how we do this. It's God's plan. I, nobody ever told me this. I'd just seen the mm. secular version. Mm. And so I was like, so we need to get married. And we need to get married in a church so God can bless our family. And she was like, yeah, absolutely. White wedding. Let's go for it. Okay. So, we got married in a church, and the kids, you know, and, and people came and these sorts of things, and, um, mm-hmm. like they do. <laughs> um, and so we got married, and God immediately started blessing our family. Mm-hmm. Uh, in that, you know, I have a very tempestuous uh, relationship with my, with my wife, always have had. Um, and we used to row before, you know, and it'd get to these areas where it's like, yeah, I hate you, I hate you, and we'd start dividing up the house and the dog and the kids, and the kids would cry, and it was just terrible, and I didn't know what the problems were. Mm-hmm. Um, but now we still argue, but it's completely different, you know, because if I'm arguing with my wife, the kids just laugh. <laughs> they know, they have that assurance that actually we didn't just make a promise to each other, we made a promise to God. Right. So we can argue, and I'm, I don't want to be, I don't want to be, I'm not going anywhere, I've promised God. Yes, yeah, so have I. And then we're in like this stalemate um, situation, but I find that that gets us through every time, and it's a real, real blessing, and it's a, it really a really underpins us as a family. So what's, what's life all about now? I mean, if before it was sort of climbing, 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 getting on top, enjoying your brief moment in the sun, realizing it's not satisfying, then trying to climb a bit more, trying to climb a bit more. What is it now? I mean, now, now that you've been saved, right? Mm. Now that you've realized you're kind of down in a pit, mm. Um, mm. heading down towards the grave, yeah. and Jesus has come into your life and, and picked you up, he's picked you up in order to do what? Mm. What's life now? Mm. Well, like I say before, I thought life was about me and it was about my pursuit of happiness. Mm-hmm. And that happiness was always fleeting. Obviously, you would know the Bible calls that sin. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so it feels good, but actually, um, it doesn't really um, take you anywhere. But now, I realize that actually I was created by a creator. And a bit like when I was talking about my marriage, I always thought a marriage was about what you can get from the other person, not realizing you're setting that person up to fail. It's about giving. And it's more blessed to give than it is to receive. And so all these divine paradoxes really have turned my world upside down, completely right. upside down. And so as I lived a life before that was about getting for me, for my gain to build my empire, mm-hmm. what I find is that um, I don't no longer pursue happiness mercilessly in fear like I did. I actually live a life of love. Mm-hmm. Um, and I find that as I pour myself out, you know, it's Pablo Picasso that says, the secret of life and I don't know if he was Christian or not, but he said the secret of life is to find your gifts and give them away. Wow. Um, and uh, I think that really is quite a powerful statement because mm. I find that as I give and, and bless other people, that's unconditional giving, God seems to bless me. Mm. And, I, and, I, and I noticed that my happiness is no longer dependent on something happening. I have a peace and a joy that, and, uh, that, that I never had before. Mm-hmm. And I'm not caught up. I, I, I like to say I'm out of the rat race 
Mm -hmm. And I mean God's grace, God's riches at Christ's expense. Mm -hmm. I think that's an incredible place to be. And actually, I believe that where Jesus starts, striving ceases. So you may have the best job in the world. You may have all these things, but actually... It's a real, there's a lot of pressure on your shoulders. Mm-hmm. You know, there's a lot with that. And um, that liberation and that freedom, I just find priceless. And I just think it's interesting that out in the world, everything offers this freedom. You know, it's, oh, this will set you free, that will fr- set, f- set you free. But mm-hmm. I've learned that actually it, the truth sets you free. Right. And, you know, you may be in a rat race, but the best you can become is King Rat. <laughs> you, you know, you might get all these things that you yeah. want, and you might, but you will, even if you're the best person in the world. Inevitably, you will be treading on somebody's feet because that's the nature of striving. Mm-hmm. It's strife. It's com- competing violently, really, yeah. against other people. You know. Yeah. Um, so, so I'd say liberation and freedom is the biggest thing that, that has impacted my life. Brilliant. Thinking about striving against other people, um, what's what's all this about? We've got we're, we're the gladiator uniforms here and here. This this will get a real airing tomorrow yes. when you're in the school doing a yeah. school assembly. Yeah. Um, what, so what do you do when you go into schools? You you put this stuff on. Um, and well, no, I was what? actually hoping you were going to wear it tonight. <laughs> I'm really disappointed. Are you tender ready? ready. <laughs> um, no, it's it's it's. It has a bit of a story in that um, when I got saved, went from death to life, you know, I was going to go back into the dust that I come out of, into um, God's promises. Uh, I was a bit confused. I was like, well, what now? Okay, I've gone on an alpha course. I feel like a different person. Actually, I don't, I'm not motivated to build an empire anymore. I'm not interested in building houses for persimmon homes or anyone else. Um, you know, what happens now? So I was asking my vicar, what now, what now? You know, instead of going to God and praying on it, um, and someone said, listen, God calls you where you're at. He will use everything. He wastes nothing. Um, so, so pray on it and see what happens. And um, I always liked to go, I always like, you know, mentally I'm like a 10-year-old kid anyway. I always liked when I was a gladiator, we'd go into schools with kids and, you know, we'd, we'd, we'd talk about the show and stuff. Uh, and I felt that, that God pointed me to the actual, the real gladiator story, not the, not the TV show that I was on, that was about bread and circuses, just entertainment on a, on a Saturday night. Mm-hmm. But the bread and circuses going back, you know, 2,000 years. Uh, and it was really significant because I knew nothing about the old gladiators. So when I started looking at that story and realized that factually, that's when Jesus turned up. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and, and, you know, they put him in a cross, in a coliseum where, gl- where, where, where gladiators were fighting. Yeah, Christians and, were thrown to the lions. Yeah, absolutely, right, by, by, absolutely. By the, by the Romans, so right. what was incredible for, uh, uh, about that for me is that it made everything so real mm. that I was like, wow. And I looked in the history books, and it turns out that it was Jesus Christ's teachings mm-hmm. that, that, that now he's come to the earth, reaching out to us. It's not eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth for an eye. It's not two, two people trying to kill each other, mm-hmm. and whoever dies, you know, one lives, and that's justice. That's not what this is. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. it was on that teaching that all the, all the Colosseums and amphitheaters were shut down right. because, you know, this Roman emperor realized, actually, yeah, this is wrong, this guy's teachings. And, of course, then the whole Roman Empire converted to Christianity, and it changed the world. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So I have a, a, an incredible time now. Hmm. I go into school, you know, and we, we're now living in an age where... Truth is not really available. You know, they say, oh, well, we've got to be multi-faith, multicultural. And the problem with that environment is that I find is that actually you can't tell the truth anymore. It offends people. The Bible is offensive. So I call it, I think, the sword of the spirit, you know, the word of God. And so you go into school and they say, well, we don't really want you to talk about Christianity. Say, but we're a Christian nation. Why can't I talk about that? And they say, well, you can talk about British values. And mm-hmm. I'm like... Mm-hmm. Well, can I talk about a queen? She's a Christian and she lives her life to the Bible. And <laughs> these things, so it's, it can be yeah. a little bit confusing, but actually what's great is that actually I can say, listen, and you, people can't argue with your testimony. When you say, listen, I've been, I've bought completely conformed to the pattern of the world. I've really bought into this. And listen, kids, for me, it was completely empty. For 42 years, I chased money and fame and it just led me in the, into what the Bible calls sin. I ended up drinking too much, smoking, partying, and actually damaging, and destroying myself and my heart. Um, and, and I point to the gladiator story of the arrival of Jesus Christ and now all of a sudden it becomes real because actually you can check the history books for this stuff this guy in front of me hasn't lost his mind you know the, the kids are not looking at me this bloke's lost his mind they're like actually he's telling a factual story and the mm-hmm. great thing is of course in school they teach him history and they can look into this so it's a real blessing you know there's lots of doors opening into primary schools and secondary schools and I'm having an absolute blast telling everybody and the great thing is like I say my family my kids, my family, and, and I meet so many people, people now who's li- I'm, I'm watching their lives 
get transformed by the power of the gospel. Mm -hmm. And what, what I find really incredible is that just by me going into school and just talk, being blessed, like this evening, go somewhere, have a fantastic meal, meet lots of great people, and you never know who you're meeting and what God's doing through them relationships. And mm -hmm. it's just, I think there can, be, there can be no more privileged place to be than to be in a place where you're saying, okay, Holy Spirit, come work through me. Yeah. I'm here, send me, I'll do it. Come in by your spirit and let's see what happens. Yeah. And that's available, you know, and, and, and you know, I've, I've heard Christians say, well, you know, I sort of go to church and these things. And I say, you're really living in the full promises of God because yes, you might be saved. You may have invited Jesus into your life and your, book, your name's in the book of life, um, but why not just die and go to heaven now then? Right. The, it says in the Bible, actually, you are, you are living in such a blessed window, a unique window in history. It's pouring his spirit out, spirit out, and he will use you and work through you right. with your gifts, the things you enjoy doing, your passions, your talents, and mm -hmm. he'll give you an abundant life, mm -hmm. and you can be part of that building that kingdom. I just think it's such an incredible opportunity. And, you know, as much as the kids are told it's all about you, it's about your career, you can do it yourself, I say, kids, it might be about you, it might be your career, but trust me, there is a calling on your life that mm -hmm. will blow anything away that TV, fame, footballing, or anything else right. can offer you. Right, you've been given those gifts to give them away. Absolutely. And if Picasso and Jesus said it, it must be true. <laughs> yeah. So, you mentioned before that Jesus, before when you were growing up as a teenager, the name of Jesus would have made you think of weakness. Absolutely. Um, and you weren't even sure he existed, right? That, so that was, that was the view of Jesus you had back then. So today, what is your view of Jesus, Warren Furman? Mm, wow, that's a question. Um, wow, where do I start with that? Hmm. Um, when Jesus went, he said, I've got to go so that you can be my hands and feet. And I see Christians and I think, wow, God can be working through them. He can fill them with his spirit and he can work through them. And I see Jesus wherever I see need. So I think the people that are the most grateful are the ones with the most need. And I think that's where you really see the spirit moving. So I really see and feel Jesus through his Holy Spirit. And I think that we've really got to, grab that with both hands you know and John sent them the Archbishop of York says you know you should always be praying for an in, in filling of that spirit because we're always leaking it and actually that's the power of God in Genesis it says that it's the Holy Spirit that moved on the earth that does things and it goes where it wants to like the wind so to me um, that's the power of God that's mm. Jesus you know that's where stuff can get done from a, a practical sense I know we have to do everything first in prayer but Jesus is love and light and he's freedom and he's the Holy Spirit. Mm. And I'll bet it's the best place to be for me. Yeah, yeah. So he can come into your life right here, right now, the spirit of Jesus in your spirit heart. Spirit of God. Amazing. So uh, in a second, we're going to hear um, a solo. It's, it's a song uh, that you know. Um, they sing it at your church today, Christ Alone, Cornerstone. Yes. Yeah. And uh, it's, it's a song that kind of makes me think of... Um, that story that Jesus tells, you know the story where there's a wise man built his house upon the rock and there's the foolish man built his house upon the sand. And of course, a, a house built on sand can look um, palatial. It can mm. look very impressive, mm. but it's still built on sand. And then Jesus has that line where he says, when the storms come, you know, not if, like mm. when the storms come, mm. the foundations are revealed and the, the foolish man's house falls and the wise man's house, even though he has to endure the storm, yet he's found something to build his life on. He's found a mm. rock, he's found a cornerstone. Mm. Um, when you look back on your life, how do you see that story kind of unpacking your story? Well, you know, it's, it's quite obvious, you know, looking back now that, that, that there, weren't, there were no foundations in, mm. in what I was building. Um, uh, and Jesus is, uh, I think we, we, uh, I was saying earlier that Jesus is the, the cornerstone and that everything else is built. You know, was it a, was it in the Bible, I'm not great with my Bible, by the way, but is it the, the stone the builders rejected? Has is that right? The, and that's where I see myself, right. you know, as this, as this comes, I'm like, yeah, but yeah, that's, that's not going to offer anything tangible for me now, you know. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but now, obviously, he's everything, you know, and, and, and he's the way, the truth, the life, and he's the only way. And, um, you know, just, just a, a little brief story here. When, when I was growing up and things got tight in my early teens, um, 
you could buy a dodgy £20 note for a fiver. <laughs> and to me, that was a good deal. <laughs> because, because you could times your money by four. And I thought, well, this is a good deal. So I remember buying one. This ain't filmed, is it? Right. So I bought this. <laughs> um, and I got this £20 note, and I was skint, and I had no money, and I, and I spent it. I thought, that's great. I thought, well, look, next time I get some benefits or whatever else, I'm going to buy two of these dodgy 20s. And um, then a friend of mine said, I said, oh, I've got a couple of them dodgy 20s here. And he said to me, um, you ain't doing dodgy 20s, are you? He said, no, no, but, you know, it's, when, it's not what you, you know a man's character when he's on his knees. You know, I was skint, so I justified it. I was like, I've got not enough money to live on, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to use this dodgy 20, this counterfeit 20. And, uh, and so I did, and he said to me, do you realise the, um, the punishment that comes with that? And I was like, no. And he said, you know, so-and-so just got locked up for like seven years for having three of them in his pocket. I was like, what? Hmm. What? They, they throw, he said, yeah, they throw, they, they, they literally, you get caught with a load of them, they throw away the key. So I made sure never to touch um, another dodgy 20 again. Mm -hmm. You know, I was like, that is counterfeit. And um, I really see that with um, Jesus Christ. You know, there's so much out there now. You know, and it's so easy to get, and with the information superhighway, the internet, you know, there's so many different people saying this is the way, this is a way, this is a way. But actually, um, you talk about Cornerstone, there is, there is only one way to know God. Mm -hmm. And it's very, very straightforward. And, and to be honest, you know, like I said, I didn't understand why this counterfeit money was so dangerous because it undermined society. It undermined families and society and for, everything for what people stood for and, you know, and, and worked for. And I think it's like that with all these half-truths. A half-truth is a lie, it's counterfeit, and it's actually dangerous. So I, I get frustrated when people say, oh, well, I'm looking at this, and I like a bit of Buddhism, and I quite like this idea, and I'm like, yeah, but <laughs> this isn't a sweet shop. You're not, you know, this is the difference between counterfeit, mm -hmm. you being diverted from truth, mm -hmm. diverted from eternity, mm -hmm. diverted from the reason you were created, to a lie, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. to you actually being eternally separated from God. Can you really gamble on that? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Can you really go somewhere else other than Jesus Christ? I don't see as that you can. So, you know, yeah. you really got to examine the evidence. You do, because he's the real deal. He is the, the reality. He is the cornerstone, and he's the one you built your life on. Yeah. So, Warren Furman, thank you so much for, for speaking to us. We uh, show our appreciation for Warren.